Good morning. It's good to be back with everybody this week. We enjoyed our day off last Sunday, but it's always good to be back. Please go ahead and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to be going over, I think, the very same verse that Corey was pointing to. I think it's really cool the way God lines these things up, right, that uh, we're all on exactly the same page this morning, and that wasn't planned, so that's pretty neat. If we remember back to the last time, two weeks ago, when we were doing our study of 1 Thessalonians 2, we talked about how Paul spoke about the work that he and his companions had done in the church when they were there the first time. And he was talking about uh, that visit from Acts chapter 17 that we actually covered uh, during the introduction to the study. But two weeks ago, when we looked at that, Paul told them, he said in verse 1, you know that the visit was effective. And then he talked about what they were doing, and he listed off some things that they didn't do. He said, They didn't do their ministry work out of impure motives. He said they weren't trying to trick the people. They weren't doing it for the money. Uh, He said they weren't mistaken in what they did. And he said that they did it not to please man, but to please God. And then he listed off two behaviors uh, that they avoided. He said they avoided flattery and they avoided greed. And so that was verses 1 through 6, Paul focusing on what they didn't do. And now in verses 7 and 8, Paul is going to talk about what they did do and how they did behave. And as we've already mentioned this morning, he compares their behavior to how a mother would act. So let's read here verses 7 through 8. He says, I'm just going to start halfway through the verse at the beginning of this paragraph. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So in verse 7, Paul's saying that he was caring for the Thessalonians in the same way that a nursing mother cares for her children. And in verse 8, he explained that this bond uh, had developed as, uh, you know, as a result of that. He loved them, and he said that arrangement that they had was delightful. He was acting as a spiritual mother to the Thessalonians, and it was a wonderful experience. And that feeling kind of rings through this entire, uh, this entire book. It's a really nice thing to read through. So apparently, Paul, his companions, and the Thessalonians, they clicked, they bonded, and he said they shared their lives together. And so there's a couple of aspects of mothering that really become apparent here uh, that Paul brings out, uh, and I want us to work through those. Being a mother to a nursing child, when you do that, there's responsibilities that come along with that. A nursing mother has a job to do. And second, a nursing mother develops a bond with her baby. And again, in verses 7 through 8, Paul covers both of those things. He's saying, I performed this job. He says, I carried out these responsibilities of being your spiritual mother. And as a result, that bond developed. That maternal bond, it's a strong one. It it really can't be broken. And Paul's saying, because he did that job, they have this bond. Now, We could leave verses 7 and 8 right there and move on. I think this is the main point that that Paul was trying to make here. But I think this metaphor of uh, of nursing, uh, spiritually nursing someone is just too good to leave alone. So I want to work through that a little bit more here because there's a lot to this comparison of, of Paul being a spiritual mother. So in the previous verses, we talked about Paul setting an example that we are supposed to emulate, right? That was, that's been a consistent theme so far in our study. So here we go. The first thing that we should consider about emulating Paul's behavior here is that a nursing mother literally gives herself to her child. A nursing mother literally gives herself to her child. You You can't be a nursing mother and let your baby be handled by someone else. I mean, with logistics today, I mean, you you don't have to be involved all of the time, but you still need to be directly involved. 
So Paul, we see, was directly involved in nursing the Thessalonians. He didn't share the gospel with them and just leave. He didn't share the gospel with them and then hand them off to someone else to have them be their problem. He said, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Paul directly provided care. He literally gave himself to the ministry of the Thessalonians. And the challenge here is that we should be doing the same thing for each other as well. Second, when a mother nurses her baby, that nourishment she provides helps her child to grow. And after some amount of time, and it's different for, uh, for different people, but after the right amount of nourishment has been given to the baby, that baby becomes ready to move on to solid food, right? And at that point, uh, nursing is not required anymore. The child is ready to move on to something more substantial. But without that nourishment, a baby will never move on to solid food. It's a critical stage in a child's development, and Paul doesn't just give us this metaphor here in, in, uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians uh, on its own. This, this metaphor of a, a nursing mother shows up elsewhere in our Bibles too. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 11 through 14 says, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by, this, by the time you... Or, in fact, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So here. Paul's using the same metaphor. A nursing mother literally gives herself to her child. A nursing mother helps her child to grow. And third, nursing mothers need more food than women who aren't nursing. All right? And this makes sense here, right? This is just basic physiology. Some, some of what a nursing mother eats gets broken down, it gets converted into milk, and that's food that otherwise uh, would have stayed to benefit the mom. But she's now nursing, so a part of her literally gets passed along to someone else. And doctors say that a nursing mother needs about 25% more calories than when she's not nursing. Right? Well, it's the very same way, you know, it's not a stretch to recognize that this works uh, also uh, spiritually as well. Just like a nursing mother needs more nourishment uh, in order to pass along nourishment to her child, anyone who's spiritually feeding another person needs all the nourishment they can get themselves. If you have a responsibility to feed someone else, you have to make sure that you yourself are being fed. Because if you aren't, you're not going to have anything to pass on to that other person. They won't get the nourishment that they need, even though they're relying on you to receive it. You want them to move on to solid food? They need to be nourished by you enough to get there. And so this should prompt another thought here, too, by extension. It's not just the amount of food that you eat that's important for a nursing mother. What a nursing mother eats is also important. A nursing mother passes on what she eats to her child. So if you're taking in a healthy diet full of vitamins and minerals and you nurse a baby, and that baby is going to get a lot of vitamins and minerals. But guess what? If you're polluting your body with drugs while you're nursing a child, you're going to pass on those poisons to your baby as well, and it's going to hurt them. You see, a nursing baby is completely defenseless and totally reliant on its mother to do the right thing and feed it the right thing. And so, of course, it's the same thing for us spiritually. You can pass on false doctrine straight from you to a baby Christian without even thinking about it. A young Christian just takes in whatever he or she is given. You can pass sin straight from you to a young Christian without even thinking about it. And the young Christian will just take in whatever he or she is given. A nursing mother passes along what she eats to a child. And the final point of comparing Paul's actions here to a nursing mother. 
A mother sacrifices for and protects her children. And this is natural, right? This is an instinctual thing that, that comes from that bond between mother and child. Remember those first two points we talked about, right? A nursing mother has a job to do, and when she does that job, this bond develops uh, between her and her baby. God designed women to be this way. You do that job from point one, you're going to develop that bond from point two. That's just how God wired us to be. That's always been a thing. That's the same concept that Solomon leveraged in that famous Bible story from 2 Kings uh, chapter 3. That was where there were these two women who lived together and each of them had a child and one of those children died and both mothers tried to claim uh, the remaining baby as their own. And so to figure out who the real mother was, King Solomon declared that the baby would be torn in half and each woman could have half of the child. And he did that knowing that the real mother would relent and give up her share to keep her baby whole. Solomon understood this concept of that bond. He knew that a real mother would sacrifice for and protect her child. In case you hadn't read that particular Bible story uh, before, they didn't go through with cutting the baby in half. He just said that to, to draw out the truth of the situation. Well, again, as we go through 1 Thessalonians and we see how Paul was treated, all that persecution that he endured, we see that bond between him and the Thessalonians because he was willing to sacrifice for and protect these young believers. He didn't abandon them to the mob. He suffered for them, and he maintained the relationship. And so, of course, this is a, a challenge for us as well. Do you have that resolve to treat your church family the same way? to suffer for and to protect the spiritually younger members of our congregation. If you do, if you have that bond, then that probably means you've been doing the job that Paul did. And if not, if you don't have that bond and you're not new to our church family, maybe take some time to evaluate that. Should you be more focused in this area? So Paul talks about in verses 7 and 8 his ministry efforts with the Thessalonians. He's comparing them there to a nursing mother caring for her child. And now in verses 9 through 12, there's a bridge here, and he's going to make a comparison between his mission, ministry efforts and a father caring for his child. Verses 9 through 12 say, Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom in glory. And we're going to talk about the role of a father here in a minute, and actually some of this might spill over into next Sunday too, but excuse me, first I want to point out something that Paul is telling us here that I'm not sure he intentionally was trying to prove out just because of time and, and cultural differences uh, between uh, today and, and when he wrote these things down. Notice here that Paul makes a differentiation between fatherly and motherly examples, right? And because he does that, we can see that there are indeed differences between a father and a mother, and again, I don't think this is a point that, that Paul was trying to make. In Paul's time, things like gender identity and the role of mother and father, those things were crystal clear to people back in Paul's day. It's now that we're attempting to redefine these things or, or say there's something different today. Uh, it's, it's worth bringing up and, and I think really looking at it. it may not have been high on Paul's agenda, but uh, it really does matter to us. Right? Today, we're told that men and women are the same. And if we say that men and women are, are different in any way, we can get in trouble because somehow the implication is that if we say genders are different, that must mean that one is inferior to the other. But that's flawed logic, right? Difference in function does not have to equal a difference in value. It doesn't. 
That's not what God intended when he made man and woman. Men and women are different. And as Paul tells us uh, right here in the verses that we've read this morning, moms and dads are different too. And Paul takes this for granted, but we can't. We have to talk about this today. These are, these are different jobs between being a mom and being a dad. There's overlap between them. And sometimes one parent has to take on both roles, and, and it can be done, and it absolutely can be done well, but that requires heroics on a level that we shouldn't normally have to deal with, and it requires a lot of extra help from God. So I'm not, I'm not down on single parents. Uh, I'm not saying it can't be done, but my point here is that from what Paul is telling us, we can see there is a fundamental segregation of duties that God baked into this whole marriage thing. And we need to recognize that and we need to celebrate it. Because think about this, if we don't, right, our culture has thrown this concept out the window. If we don't hold on to this concept about a, a, what a biblical family is supposed to look like in another generation or two, nobody's going to know anymore, right? All that is going to be gone and it'll be forgotten. In our culture today, fathers are a family joke, but the reality is a child's mother is critically important to the child, and a child's father is critically important to the child. We spent a fair amount of time this morning working through the importance of a mother to a child, and we saw that that was a metaphor of spiritual nurturing. And we saw that that was needed, and, and we, we saw that there's these things that a mother does for her child that she is uniquely built to do for her children. Now here in verses 9 through 12, we see things that a father is uniquely built to do for his children. Starting in verse 9, we see this instruction of the value of hard work. A good father sets an example for his children, working hard to put food on the table, make sure business is taken care of, and that the home has stability. And listen, that's probably worth the whole sermon in and of itself, but superficially, I don't think this idea needs a whole lot of explanation. This point is deep, but it's pretty clear. But I do want to make one other note, though, uh, of, some, of another point Paul is making here. Let's look again at verses 11 through 12. I'm going to reread that. He says, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, and here it is, the description of the father, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Paul's saying that a father teaches his children to live lives worthy of God. And fathers, do not miss this. Just as God designed women to be naturally effective nurturers, God also designed men to naturally be effective at teaching their children to follow Him. Listen to this. The Promise Keepers in the Baptist Press did some research on how exactly the faith of dads impacted their families, and here's a small part of what they found. In families where the father does not attend church... In families where the father does not attend church, even if the mother attends, only one child in 50 in families like that will go on to attend church regularly when they grow up. One in 50. That's a 2% chance that that child will go on to attend church if they did not see their father making that a priority. But they also found that if the father does go to church regularly, regardless of whether the mother does or not, between half to two-thirds of the children coming from families like that attend church regularly when they grow up. That is a 50 to 66% chance that those children will go on to be regular church attenders. Dads, that means that everything else being equal in your life, right? Not making any other changes or looking at anything differently you improve the odds of your children making church a priority later on in their life on average by 2,900% if you set the example that church is important. Your child will have a 2,900% improved chance of being a churchgoer when they grow up if you do that yourself. 
And look, church attendance does not equal salvation. I get that, but there is a correlation. And guys, of everything that you want for your kids, them making it to heaven has to be the number one priority. Paul says, dads, you are uniquely equipped to help your children with this, the most important thing they they will ever grapple with. We want a lot of things for our kids, but you know, if we get to see him in heaven someday, none of those other things are really going to matter. Dads, you are important. You matter. You matter probably more than you know. So if we're going to put all this together, this being a mother and being a, a spiritual father, and look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 to 12 as a whole, we see Paul acting like a godly parent. We can see another example for us that I want to point out and, and work through, and we'll do that, and then we'll call it a day. Paul, in everything that he did here, was showing integrity, right? Paul was showing Christian integrity in everything that he's talked about. That's what he's teaching us in the first couple of chapters of uh, First Thessalonians. And as Christians, we need to be like this too. That's going to be the difference, really, that shows the world that we're different, right? It's going to be the difference that shows that there's a better way than what's outside of the walls of this church. Let me read you a quote here about integrity. This comes from a man named Stephen Carter. He wrote a book called Integrity. He wrote the book on it. And this is how he defines the term at the beginning of the book. And as we read through this definition, I want you to keep in mind what Paul has been saying in 1 Thessalonians, right? And as we think about this definition, he says, quote, integrity requires three steps. One, discerning what is right and what is wrong. Two, acting on what you have discerned, even at personal cost. And three, saying openly that you are acting on your understanding of right and wrong. And he goes on to uh, clarify and expand on all three points. He said, the first criterion captures the idea of integrity as requiring a degree of moral reflectiveness. The second brings in the idea of an integral person as steadfast, which includes the sense of keeping commitments. The third reminds us that a person of integrity is unashamed of doing the right thing. That's a good definition, right? It's just biblical. And this is exactly how Paul said that he's living. This is what we've been working through so far in chapters 1 and 2 of 1 Thessalonians. Paul living out this definition of integrity. And remember what we said from two weeks ago. We said, Paul's spelling this out here. He's saying, I did these things. I did it this way not to make himself look good. But he's saying these things because he wants us to imitate him, imitating Christ. Paul is doing this. He's telling us these things because he wants us to do this too. He wants us to discern what's right and what's wrong. He says we should be acting on what we've discerned even at personal cost. And we need to be saying openly that we have acted on our understanding of what's right and what's wrong. Listen, we're living at a time when this kind of integrity is completely missing from our society. And actually, living this way is now frowned upon. You guys remember me harping on uh, the fact that there's no gray area when it comes to spiritual matters. It's been a while since we've made that point, but we made that point a lot of times on Sunday mornings back when we were studying 1 Corinthians. And to recap that idea or that concept, we'd say... In the grand spectrum of things, on one hand, we have what's biblical and godly over here, and then over here, we've got what's evil, and and that's true, right? These are uh, polar, polar opposites. This is the duality of the world. Those are the two ends of the spectrum. But the lie that the world tries to tell us is that there's this neutral middle ground in between the two and that spiritually some things can live there. But as we worked through before in the Bible, it's just not a possible concept, Everything that exists either glorifies God spiritually or it works against Him. The Bible tells us to act like this. It tells us we need to have this kind of integrity. Well, if you think about it, then it's no wonder about this gray area that our culture tries to talk about or tries to introduce, that it attacks this very thing as a lifestyle. 
Our culture is not neutral. There is no neutral. Our culture is either honoring God or it's working against Him. This, this idea of integrity, this definition of integrity is about recognizing right and wrong and acting on it. But what does our society say today instead? It says right and wrong are fluid concepts. They change whenever anybody wants them to. And if that's the case, right, and that's what's being taught in our schools, that's how everything's being repackaged and and represented today. If that's the case, then it becomes absolutely impossible to act with biblical integrity. If right and wrong are turned into fluid constructs, it is impossible then for us to emulate Paul emulating Christ. You can't be a good Christian anymore. So I think it's no coincidence that our society is moving in this direction. It's a conscious moving away from God. Getting rid of right and wrong gets rid of this possibility of Christian integrity. We can't emulate Paul emulating Christ anymore. Our culture's also been hard at work at getting rid of the meaning of sacrifice, too. We talked about how Paul was behaving like a parent and sacrificing for his spiritual children. He said he wasn't doing any of these things for selfish reasons. And our culture today also has tried to stamp this out too. There's a philosophy out there that's been around for a long time. It's called psychological egoism. And the short explanation to that is this philosophy says that nothing ever is done selflessly. Everything that people do is inherently selfish. Every action is selfish. And this uh, school of thought holds that it's impossible for people to behave altruistically. They explain away altruistic behavior by saying, well, it's really not something we do for others. We do it for ourselves. We do something for someone else to make ourselves feel good. We're really just behaving selfishly. And of course, this philosophy is completely ridiculous, but this is what I was taught in high school. It was taught when I went to college for my bachelor's degree. You, you've probably encountered this as well. And you know, when I was taught these things, I just kind of laughed them off. But when you really think about it in light of this definition of integrity and what else Paul has been talking about in 1 Thessalonians, this is very, very dangerous philosophy. Because if all actions are selfish, again, it becomes impossible for us to emulate Paul emulating Christ. If psychological egoism is true, there is no way we can live like Paul's example from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We could never be spiritual parents like he was because he was doing it selflessly. Remember, we don't earn our salvation. By this point, Paul already had his ticket to heaven. He's already saved, right? Regardless of what he was doing, he was going to get his reward, but he was still acting this way. He said he was doing it for the glory of God and not for any other reason. And today, by contrast, we pay money, our tax money, so our children can be taught that such behavior is beyond the capability of man. We're taught everything is about us. Seeking pleasure uh, is what we need to do, and we're only supposed to worry about number one. We're told that we're incapable of making anyone else happy until we first make ourselves happy. Look out for number one, and that's it. That's the way to fulfillment, the world says. We can keep repeating that, but that won't make it true. The Bible shows us a better way. Paul shows us a better way here in 1 Thessalonians. In addressing this truth, a scholar named Michael Holmes wrote these words. And here he's talking about the world's view that the only way to be happy is to focus on yourself. And he's looking at that in light of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, the irony in this is that in giving of himself for the sake of others... Paul found happiness and satisfaction for himself. Indeed, if chapter 2, verse 8 is any indication, Paul seems a bit overwhelmed by the extent to which the relationship with the Thessalonians developed. In loving others, he seems to have received back more than he could have imagined. In doing so, he proved the truth of what Jesus taught when he said, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And so here, we're going to have to stop. We're at the end of our time. But I want to challenge you, though, this week, be thinking about these verses. Be thinking about the things that we've worked through. Think about how Paul was acting like a mother and a father to the Thessalonians. Right? He was being all things to all people, as Paul tried to do. And think about 
Are there any aspects to this that you need to start emulating or maybe start emulating more? And also take a moment to really reflect on this concept of biblical integrity that we talked about. If someone were to describe you, would they describe you this way? And if not, why not? So Lord willing, we'll meet together next Sunday. And we'll look at the next installment of this. And we're going to do a little bit more work with uh, this passage here. But uh, until then, I think we've got enough to work through this week. Will you bow with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Lord, we thank you so much for letting us be here this morning. We thank you for your word and we thank you for Paul's example. Lord, please give us wisdom from these things that we have worked through. Lord, help us to emulate Paul as he was emulating Christ. Lord, we pray that these examples would work in our hearts so we might be able to glorify you more with what we do. Lord, we love you so very much. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.